Good morning from the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, um, where we are having a discussion this morning on Canada's implementation of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and what that may mean for business and the economy as we recover from COVID. This is a very important topic, one that, uh, that has been of great interest to the United States. Those of you who, um, who have been following this will know this well. The UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was promulgated, uh, ratified in September of 2007. It wasn't until December of 2010 that the United States signed on. Canada signed on to UNDRIP in May of 2016. And it was only December 3rd, 2020, not that long ago, that Canada introduced Bill C-15 to implement its UN uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Commitments. That's the proximate trigger for this event, the reason that we're gathering. And it's also a, an opportunity for me to work with Catherine Tegelberg. Catherine is the new uh, director of the Global Center for Indigenous Community Relations at Newmont Corporation, which is a, an important sponsor and supporter of ours at the Wilson Center. And it was through them that I met Catherine and Catherine was uh, gracious enough to uh, to partner with us on this event as we try to socialize what's going on in Canada for our American uh, viewers. Catherine, let me turn it over to you to um, to kick things off. Well, good morning. Thank you. Um, I want to give a, a really brief introduction of um, where we are uh, coming from at Newmont. So Newmont recently launched the Global Center for Indigenous Community Relations, uh, and I work with that center. Our purpose is to advocate for excellence in engagement with Indigenous peoples, both within Newmont and across the broader uh, resource sector. And one way that we feel quite strongly that we can do that is by convening dialogues such as this one today uh, to broaden our knowledge and share experiences and ultimately contribute to strong industry practices um, when engaging with Indigenous communities. As Newmont operates in diverse Indigenous territories in Canada, Australia, uh, the US and Latin America, all have different uh, approaches to UNDRIP. So it's important for us to think about how policy is evolving and what we as a business can do to demonstrate for respect for Indigenous rights and also understand um, the evolving policy context within which we work. So that was part of the impetus for us to get involved in this dialogue. Uh, we have some wonderful uh, panelists that I'm very excited to hear from today and I give them a lot of respect because it's very early in the morning for most of them um, and we really appreciate them being willing to, to give their thoughts. And so I'll hand it back over to Chris to, to give the introductions. And I'm just so pleased that Newmont could be a part of uh, bringing together such great people to, to hear their, their views on where things are going with UNDRIP in Canada and broader and beyond. Excellent. Thank you very much, Catherine. And, and really is great to, uh, to be able to partner with you. Our first speaker, is, um, I like to think, a rock star in the field. Um, Professor Cheryl Lightfoot is Senior Advisor to the President of the University of British Columbia on Indigenous Affairs. She's a, a noted scholar, um, has been working in these, uh, in the, on these issues from her PhD days on, um, and is among those people that uh, in the United States or in Canada is a go-to for understanding uh, the status of our indigenous relations here in North America. I say that because for our American viewers, um, she is uh, as well-versed, I think, on what's happening in the United States and around the world uh, as she is in Canada, which is, which is tremendous. I'm gonna turn it over to Cheryl to give us some opening remarks, but before I do, one last bit of housekeeping. During today's discussion, if you're viewing this online, you can submit questions for the panel, either by tweeting them to us uh, at Canada Institute, it's just one word, at Canada Institute, or send us an email at Canada, at sign, wilsoncenter.org. And this is another one of our great cultural differences. Uh, we're south of the border, and so we spell Wilson Center ER and not RE. So uh, in case you have that uh, bounce back, that's the problem. With that, let me turn it over to Cheryl uh, for our 
opening uh, presentation on the historical background and context of, of UNDRIP and how we find ourselves where we are. Good morning, and thank you very much for that intro. I believe I have screen sharing options, correct? So I could show a quick slide deck. Thank you so much uh, for allowing me just a few minutes to set the tone and talk about a bit of the historical background and context of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And I would say that normally I teach whole courses in this topic. So I'm gonna try to give you a very quick overview in uh, 10 minutes or less. So bear with me. And I know we have plenty of time for discussion and Q&A later on. So if there's anything that is unclear in this very uh, fast look through, we can try to clean it up uh, later. Uh, I think it's important to understand from the beginning of the discussion that the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is in so many ways a global transformation. And um, I call it in my own work a subtle revolution because I think it is often overlooked and unseen, and yet is producing some significant shifts, both within nation states and then also within the larger international community. And although we could speak about many, I think it's important to really focus on what I would consider the top three. This is one of the first documents that has been accepted uh, by almost in, in at least a formal way, almost all countries on earth and has a recognition for the collective rights of indigenous peoples. So this is their rights to exist, not just as individuals and citizens of nation states, but also as their own collectives, as their own people, as their own nation. And so that's an important point to understand. And secondly, it, it conducts a, a huge amount of work in correcting some discriminatory legal exclusions that have been ex in existence uh, since the dawn of the nation state era. So since the Treaty of Westphalia. And then thirdly, it provides us a set of directions for a new guiding framework of the appropriate relationships that should exist or hope to, we hope exist between indigenous people and non-indigenous people and indigenous people and states. And this is where we're going to go very quickly through uh, decades of history. Um, if we look at the pre-existing human rights framework that came up from the end of World War II until the 1970s, when the indigenous rights movement really launched, we have all of uh, these documents uh, and conventions in front of us, uh, just a snapshot actually of the human rights framework. But it's important to note that with all of these, and these are the primary ones, there were particular indigenous uh, exclusions or erasures or just overlookedness uh, in creating these documents that did not fully uh, recognize and embrace and attempt to correct some of the issues going on in the indigenous, indigenous experience around the world. And just very briefly, uh, we could talk about a couple particular pieces, which have uh, often come into play in settler societies, like in Canada, the United States, also Australia and New Zealand, among several others around the world. So there are some existing discriminatory legal doctrines that treat indigenous peoples in settler states differently than other peoples. And one, of course, is this notion, particularly evident in Australia, but not exclusively, that when when explorers arrived, that and land was empty and theirs for the taking and land that they could exert sovereignty over. And there is this uh, entire body of law that comes out of the papal bulls of the age of exploration that left us uh, with the doctrine of discovery, which uh, unfortunately was the first international law, first international agreement in the modern uh, world post-Renaissance. And it indicated that Europeans had the right to settle, conquer, and exert sovereignty over other peoples that were not Christians and from Europe. So that unfortunately was left in place uh, with the human rights regime that came up after World War II. And then similarly, as the world set out on its decolonization 
exercise in the 1960s, 1970s and beyond, uh, there was a particular exclusion in that indigenous peoples in settler states were left without the right to decolonize under the, the UN regime. Only colonies located over saltwater, discontiguous colonies uh, were eligible under the regime for self-determination. So indigenous peoples were left with some uh, kind of second class right of self-determination. And beginning in the 1970s, there were two grassroots movements that, that, that came up out of, uh, coming out of the American Indian movement in the United States, coalescing at Standing Rock, South Dakota in the mid seventies. Similarly, here in British Columbia, another movement came up for different reasons, but also from similar experiences. And by the late 1970s, 1977, these two movements began linking up and working internationally. Uh, and their first meeting at the United Nations was in 1977, organized by these two organizations that had begun to uh, put their eyes internationally and indicate that perhaps uh, an international document that articulated the rights of indigenous peoples in a human rights frame could be brought back into the domestic context to help remedy the, the injustices that were going on locally. Uh, 30 years later, uh, after much negotiation and there are uh, uh, been entire books written on uh, the experience of drafting and negotiating the, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, so it's a very lengthy story. So we will quickly walk over 30 years of those histories and those contestations. In September 2007, to the surprise of many uh, and, and the sheer delight of the Indigenous activists that had been some of them working on this document for those 30 years, uh, it passed the UN General Assembly uh, by votes of 143 for, some abstentions, and four votes against. And that was Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and the United States. If we look at this quote from Les Malizer, who was chairperson of the Global Indigenous Caucus that day in September 2007, he noted that the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, it's important to note, contains no new human rights. It merely affirms the many rights that are already contained in those international human rights treaties that we saw a few slides ago, but the rights that have been denied to indigenous peoples. So it situates indigenous peoples within the battery of human rights and equalizes them, tries to remedy those previous exclusions. It's important to understand what a UN declaration does and does not. Um, similar to the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, it's a statement of principles that should be taken up by nation states in order to adhere to those principles. Uh, this particular dec declaration emphasizes the right again of indigenous peoples to maintain and strengthen their peoplehood, their nationhood, their traditions, their institutions as peoples, not simply as citizens of a nation state. And it prohibits discrimination against them. And again, the, it asserts their collective rights that uh, supports their treaties, pursues their own vision of development and encourages their participation in decision-making on issues that affect them. It's intended to guide our policy development around the world, uh, guide our negotiations, and also our litigation. And similarly, uh, on the indigenous level, it's also intended to strengthen communities and guide nation building. A couple of key points on the declaration are there is currently no nation state that officially stands in opposition to it anymore. All of the countries that voted no have in the meantime switched their positions uh, 2009, 2010, all four of them one at a time switched to statements of support or uh, accepted the declaration. So there are no uh, naysayers left out in the world. 
it's important to remember as well that this is a remedial tool. So this is not additive to the human rights regime. It's merely corrective, uh, trying to establish an equal set of rights for indigenous peoples. And again, recognize them as peoples, as nations, even within a settler society. And it serves as a source of rules and rights for indigenous peoples uh, in their relationships with others in the society. Now, if we look at just a few notes about where we've been in Canada in the last few years, uh, we had a fundamental uh, shift changing event occur in this area in, in the late 2000s, early teens. Uh, we had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission come about. And again, there's a very long backstory to how this happened. But uh, at the end of the day, after several years of work, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, or TRC, tabled its final report in 2015, along with 94 calls to action. And critical among these, and what I call in many ways the game changer or the discourse changer in Canada, was call 43 and call 44. So call 43 of this 94 calls to action said specifically that federal, provincial, territorial, and municipal governments should all fully adopt and implement the UN Declaration as the framework for reconciliation in Canada. And then similarly, call number 44 called upon Government of Canada, and this has now been interpreted by many, many others, uh, other types of governments, provincial, state, territorial, and even municipal now, in this case of Vancouver, to develop a national action plan strategies and other concrete measures to advance the goals and achieve the goals of the UN Declaration. And so some of the actions we've seen lately, uh, British Columbia in 2019 passed its uh, BC's Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, what we now refer to as DRIPA. Uh, it passed unanimously uh, in the province. Important to note is that uh, this is the first piece of legislation in the English speaking world to advance the UN declaration within a legislative framework. It was co-developed with indigenous leadership in the province, which I think has been one of its strengths. And uh, it encourages an action plan on the provincial level uh, without delay. The pandemic has interrupted that somewhat, but we can discuss that later on in the Q&A. And um, also important, is it recognizes not just uh, Indian Act bans or, or tribal governments as we think of them on the US side, uh, but all forms of indigenous governing bodies. So this could be hereditary governments, traditional governments, and it's opened up a new space that we previously had not seen. And then currently, and I'm sure this will be the focus of quite a bit of discussion this morning, is the proposed Bill C-15, which is a similar bill on the federal level. And this is uh, very similar to an earlier bill that was tabled uh, a number of years ago by MP Romeo, Romeo Saganash, which was called Bill C-262. This is a government bill, however. This is being brought forward by the ruling Liberal Party. And it is very similar in substance to that earlier bill, but it adds a significant preamble, which is uh, become quite a topic of interest for a number of legal scholars and other scholars as we consider what the preamble actually means in law and in practice. And so this is currently in committees and uh, experiencing uh, the usual debates and contestations we would see in a parliamentary committee. So I'd like to uh, stop there and turn over uh, back to our moderators. And I hope that that helps us uh, orient uh, the discussion this morning. Wonderful. Thank you very, very much, Professor Lightfoot. I think that uh, set the stage beautifully. And for people who have not followed the development of this, as you say, it's been 30 years. I think it uh, it's moving moved along well. And I think you've given us the touch points that we need as we go into a panel discussion, widening this, this conversation a little bit. Our panel includes uh, Dr. Lightfoot and three outstanding experts. Um, I'm going to introduce them in alphabetical order by last name. Uh, first, we have Tabitha Bull, who is president and CEO of the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business. Then we have Dr. Ken Coates, professor and Canada research chair in regional innovation 
at the John Johnson Shoyama School of Public Policy at the University of Saskatchewan. Next, we have Alan Edzerza, who is a member of the British Columbia First Nations Energy and Mining Council and a citizen of the Talton Nation. And again, we'll have uh, Professor Lightfoot. I'm going to turn over to Catherine uh, to help with the moderation of the actual panel. Um, one brief reminder for those watching, you can send us questions either by tweeting them to at Canada Institute, or if you're not a Twitter person, good for you, um, try an email to Canada at wilsoncenter.org. With that, let me turn it over to you, Catherine. Well, thanks. I, I will, uh, maybe I'll put the, the question to the panel. I think uh, Cheryl Lightfoot, Professor Lightfoot, you, you made an important reference um, at the end of your presentation on the work of the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission in Canada and the calls to action. And so I think one of the things that's really important for our audience to understand is how you feel that UNDRIP is an important reference point for reconciliation in Canada and specifically how C15 may contribute to that or, or maybe even if it will contribute to that. And I'd love to get uh, your viewpoints as a, as a panel on um, how you see this uh, contributing to that ongoing work going forward. Maybe to, uh, this is always the hard thing about being on these virtual things. You oh, never yeah. know who gets to talk first. Um, I'll let you call people out, Kevin. Well, maybe I know, Ken, we've had a few comments on this before in the past, and I would, uh, maybe I'll let you kick that off and, and start the fire a bit, and then we can go to to the other members of the panel. Sorry, I should uh, I should have called on someone, so. No, well, th th thanks very much, and, and great to be with uh, all these other wonderful wonderful panelists. Uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing what they all have to say on this very important topic. Um, a couple of surprises, Catherine, to sort of start, if you don't mind, and that is that if I, I was one of those, uh, Cheryl referred to those uh, the, the people who didn't think uh, under was going to pass. I was one of those in 2007 who was convinced it wouldn't. I just could not see a line where national government sort of accepted uh, under it. And, and it was you know very controversial at the time when it came, came forward and the four Canadian four countries, Canada, which was one, said sort of we're not going to go along with this and, and took a long time sort of coming around. Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, for, for American viewers um, had, a, had a huge impact on Canada. It was the, the focus was on residential schools and sort of the, the legacy of residential schools. And it came up with these very, very strong recommendations of the 94 sort of measures. Um, and it actually transformed an awful lot of sort of the discussion. The companies have taken up the sort of the, the challenge of sort of, you know, what are we doing in terms of truth and reconciliation, school systems, city councils, et cetera, et cetera. We're now seeing across the country where, where you know, community, communities, municipal governments are saying, let's take UNDRIP as sort of an organizing principle. Um, but, but in both cases, the challenge has been, I think a simple one, how do you take these really good, you know, sort of broad principles with which almost everybody can agree and can, change them into immediate action. Um, and so I, I always like to say, but actually I don't like to say this, but I, I always feel compelled to say this. Canadians are very strongly supportive of Indigenous rights until Indigenous people have those rights. They're very, very supportive in abstract. So we love the idea of empowering Indigenous people. Then all of a sudden they get power in a whole bunch of ways through modern treaties, uh, through things like UNDRIP, through some reconciliation or whatever. And then we start seeing pushback. People say, well, you know, we didn't really mean that. We didn't really want it to go that far. Um, and so what we actually have now is a country where, where the, the public conversation is very much informed by truth and reconciliation, at this point to a lesser degree by UNDRIP, um, but maybe UNDRIP is sort of a logical sort of extension of, of truth and reconciliation, um, where Canadians are wrestling with this question of, of how do we get rid of the legacy of sort of 150 plus well, hundreds of years of discrimination and hostility um, and brutal treatment of Indigenous peoples in, the, in a whole bunch of different ways. And I'll end with one observation. Um, indigenous peoples live with a legacy of that discrimination every single day until it's addressed. So when things drag out, when UNDRIP goes from 2007 and here in 2021, we're still sort of talking about what does it mean and what, et cetera, et cetera. Remember that Indigenous communities are living with the consequences of 
marginalization, entrenched discrimination, economic you know, challenges, um, and, and just general hostility. Um, and until we actually do something about it on a practical level, then, then we're, we're just making ourselves feel good uh, about, about what UNDRIP represents in Truth and Reconciliation. So our challenge is to actually make this stuff real. And we're not doing as well with that as we should. Absolutely. Thanks, Ken. Maybe I will pass the, the baton over to Tabitha because I know that you have had a lot of thought put into specifically the, the topic of economic reconciliation and what does that look like and what does that mean? So perhaps you could expand on that for our, our listeners on, on what that should look like going forward. Thanks, Anne. Thanks so much for having me. And Cheryl, I, I could have listened to the whole lecture, actually. So I, I am uh, very uh, honored to be here. Thank you to everyone. Uh, I think just to think about that initial question about reconciliation, uh, the important part about TRC is that it's about truth and reconciliation. And without understanding that truth, the truth of the history in Canada, uh, the truth, as Ken mentioned, of, of how reality is today, we really can't move forward on reconciliation and and anyone who hasn't read the principles of UNDRIP to read them, it seems like common sense. It seems like why do we have to have this piece of paper to treat people equitably um, and, you know, to talk to people that that might not be familiar with UNDRIP um, and in doing so about today's panel. Uh, a number of people were like how why would anybody oppose that how can we how could we have as a country not have um voted in favor of that in in the first place i think it came as a real shock to a number of people um and still does so in the first thing i think about undrip and implementation of undrip and bill c15 is that it is opening um Canadians and uh, Americans eyes to the inequities that exist and to the history and, and the truth that exists in our countries, which, in my uh, opinion, education is really the key for us to all move forward on reconciliation. Um, uh, the other uh, items is to speak specifically about economic reconciliation. So within the truth and reconciliation calls to action, there is call to action 92. What call, which calls on the corporate sector of Canada to adopt UNDRIP as a reconciliation framework and the principles within it and apply that to the work that they do. So we definitely see this at our work at the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business uh, with corporate Canada within Canada trying to understand how they can do better to work with Indigenous business and Indigenous communities. And part of that is to help um, support Indigenous business through business development or through purchasing from them. Um, and within in so doing, we're building this economic framework and closing the social economic gaps that exist. And we see that because we know that Indigenous businesses employ more Indigenous people. They also include within their business plan uh, a large major majority of them uh, options and items to which help support their community. Um, and build up their community or provide education for youth. Um, so that's building this, closing this social economic gap by supporting Indigenous business. The other interesting uh, component of that is that it starts to build generational wealth. So if we consider that the Indian Act in Canada purposefully uh, excluded Indigenous people from participating in the economy, um, as an example, there are provisions in the Indian Act that did not allow for Indigenous people to sell agriculture um, or uh, cattle that they had raised off of their reserve without a permit or a pass. Uh, and those provisions were in existence and within, within, until 1960, so uh, not forcibly enforced, but still in existence. So if we think about how long we have been removed from the economic situation of Canada, it's going to take us time to get back to where we really should be. And we need corporate Canada and we need uh, the government and the state to support that economy within Indigenous communities and businesses in order for us to get to reconciliation. Thanks, Tabitha. I think that's a really important um, uh, point around just the role that, that business can play in, in this uh, work. 
Alan, perhaps I'll turn the microphone over to you at this point to get your views, um, both as a as an industry um, participant, but also as an Indigenous leader in British Columbia and the, the perspectives of the work that's already been done on DRIPA that Cheryl mentioned, but how you see this working towards reconciliation um, from your view viewpoint. Good morning. And thank you very much um, for the invite to participate on the panel. I'd like to begin by saying that I'm joining you today from my home in Abbotsford, the unceded territory of the Stolen Nation people. I am Taltan, and I am a member of the Taltan Elders Council. And my um, input today is not so much from an academic perspective, but one that lived it, I've lived it. Um, when we talk about reconciliation, it's critically important to look back to see where we came from. You know, we talk about the racist policies and discriminatory pro, um, policies that Canada had. Um, I can say that I lived it. I'm, my dad had to enfranchise to become a non-status Indian, to be able to go to public schools, to have the right to vote. Things that were taken for granted by citizens of Canada. I think it's important to acknowledge that the government of today is at least committed to bring Bill C-15 forward and express their intent to put it through the parliamentary process and proclaim it into law. And for that, I applaud them. You know, people have talked about Terra Nullis and the doctrine of discovery. You know, um, when Canada was formed, they, they took over Rupert's land and the territories under the expressed requirement to um, to address the Aboriginal land question. And, um, you know, and, and this is demonstrated as they went through the treaty process, the number treaty process. But what the UN Declaration does for us, it starts to spread, it puts in place the foundational principles to build reconciliation. You know, when you talk about the recognition of Aboriginal title, recognizing, to me, that means that finally they're gonna recognize as a sovereign people, the sovereign nations. They recognize the inherent right of self-government. We've never given up our right to uh, govern ourselves. The, the requirement of our consent when you're looking at developing our lands and resources and of course, the human rights aspect of this, the UN Declaration. I think all of those principles are important if we're gonna to look to reconciliation. This bill, C-15, needs us, need to move us beyond consultation. The new, the new minimum, has to be consent. Um, I've heard debates about whether you should use Bill 15 as an, in, in an interpretive way to look at existing legislation. My preference would have been to use an omnibus bill approach and be clear that the bill is paramount legislation where inconsistencies occur. I remind people that Canada considers itself a civil society based on law. I wanna, you know, section 35 in our constitution is a requirement to, to look at Aboriginal title and rights in a different way. 
But I've, what I witnessed as an individual is as you see these important cases come down like Calder, Sparrow, Dalgamut, Shokotan, Haida, we don't see the legislation in, the, in Canada change to recognize those major court decisions. That kind of stuff has to stop. What we see with, with the uh, legislation, Bill C-15, there's a UN, the uh, UN Declaration Act in British Columbia. We hear the politicians saying all the right things, but we got to recognize that there's a bureaucracy behind that drives it. And that bureaucracy is where we see it bogged down. So it's not good enough just to talk about politically. We need to talk about the bureaucracy also being need to change. When we look at business, you know, <clears throat> there's a court decision that talks about, you know, the government has the toolbox to address Aboriginal title and rights. You know, that, that's a legislative toolbox, the regulatory toolbox. And they should not try to push that over to industry to implement consent. But what we are seeing with the industry is that they are leaders. You know, I, I see them more and more uh, moving to the idea that consent is essential if they're gonna move forward. And I remind people that consent is the, is the best form of certainty that it, anybody could ask for. And uh, when you start looking at development costs that go into the millions and tens of millions, hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, certainty is absolutely essential if you wanna do that. Anyway, those are some of the comments that I have and I, and I appreciate the opportunity to express them. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. It's always so important to hear from both the lived experience and um, and some of the larger concepts to make this, to put this into context for us. So I, I really appreciate you being willing to share both your personal perspective and, uh, and what you see as some of the bigger um, notions that we need to consider. Um, perhaps Cheryl, I'll pass it over to you. I know you've already made a few comments on reconciliation, but just to give you the opportunity to also chime in here on this topic. Well, thanks for that, Catherine. And now that we can take a little bit more of a relaxed tone, I'd also like to mention that uh, with respect, I am joining you from the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people this morning, uh, which is also known as the campus of uh, the University of British Columbia. And uh, how we are uh, remedying that and rectifying that and having conversations about that is also happening uh, all the way down to the university level. And city of Vancouver, uh, uh, just a few weeks ago passed uh, a, a resolution that they also intend to begin uh, talking uh, in this way. They have passed a resolution to advance a plan here in the city of Vancouver that will include creation of a task force with the three local nations, Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil to talk about, in essence, a uh, action plan for implementing the declaration here in Vancouver. And we've also uh, done similar. I've been been leading uh, for the past several years a Indigenous strategic planning process here at the University of British Columbia, which um, has as its goal uh, the idea that we will take a look at the UN Declaration and see how we can implement it in a post-secondary setting. So there are lots of different ways that this uh, UN Declaration is being taken up, and my colleagues have all mentioned them, and they've also mentioned the stickiness, uh, the the challenging points. And I think it's just as important to understand that uh, when we talk about all of this activity in Canada. And I fully agree that the TRC, I call it the game changer, the conversation changer, the discourse changer. You can, it, it was palpable. You could, you could feel this fundamental shift that occurred in 2015 
from a, a, a previous position where the declaration was considered um, a, a, a nice set of principles, uh, something that the UN had developed perhaps that uh, was being imposed on Canada and that needed to be resisted because we had our own constitution with section 35 and we had our own sets of litigation and we were all very proud of that. The TRC changed that conversation in an instant and uh, reminded Canada that we still have a lot of work to do in this area, that when we set our legal and legislative frameworks and policy frameworks up against the principles of the declaration, we can see quite well uh, where we are falling short. And so that has created um, some in, in inertia in, in, or as some, some momentum in particular ways that uh, are, are breaking through some of the, the previous inertia. Um, where I think it's important to understand what, again, UN declarations like this do and don't do. Uh, there's nothing in C-15 that automatically enshrines it into law. We haven't seen that happen in British Columbia, uh, but it does do some very important things that I think have long-term positive effects. And I appreciate Alan's comments about the bureaucracy, because I think that's actually, if we look at British Columbia and we look nationally, I agree, that's our major sticking point in, in advancing uh, the, the principles here in Canada. I also agree that business uh, is generally uh, doing quite well. Uh, not entirely. There are always exceptions, and some of those exceptions uh, do become high profile. But if we look on the ground, uh, business and industry, uh, as Alan mentioned, consent and reaching a good relationship and reaching a good agreement is the best form of certainty. And businesses have been taking that up uh, with or without the TRC uh, simply because uh, it works and it's good for business. And uh, if an agreement can be struck that everyone is content with, business proceeds. And, and so just on that pragmatic level, I think many have adopted these principles on their own uh, without needing C-15 as a direction. But I can tell you, and I'm sure Alan will agree with me, the ones who do need C-15 as a direction or the British Columbia legislation is the bureaucracy, uh, because that's where a lot of the stickiness uh, is that we're currently seeing. So if we bring the declaration more into a legal framework, what can we expect? Uh, well, nothing changes overnight. Uh, none of this is, is a is a silver bullet, uh, what we'd see is uh, a slower incremental adaptation of government and others beginning to use those principles for policy development, policy revision, and decision making. And I think that's where we begin to aim at the bureaucratic level. There's a clear direction uh, that they would need to follow and also be accountable to it because there's annual reporting, there's uh, alignment with action plans. We would also anticipate uh, an increased level of courts, courts uh, of all levels citing the declaration and using it as an interpretive tool in their decisions. And I'm, I can report that so far, I, and I've done some analysis of this uh, in my research portfolio, as of November 2020, we have 98 cases in total in Canada that have also that have referred in some way to the UN declaration uh, to date. And so they're in all kinds of areas, consultation, FPIC, childcare, welfare, culture, equality, non-discrimination. If we were to proceed with federal legislation, we, I think, will expect even a, a greater increase in those cases because it just becomes a bit more of the language uh, and the legal language as well in Canada. And then, um, of course, on the international level, all of those international treaties and conventions that Canada has signed, and it has signed just about every human rights convention, the only human rights document Canada ever objected to in the, its entire history was the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So uh, what we do see is all of these other treaty bodies, the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, the International Convention on Civil Political Rights, the Universal Periodic Review, those 
bodies are increasingly using the UN Declaration as an interpretive tool uh, in its human rights rulings and recommendations. And then finally, I think one of the most important effects that we begin to see, and I think this has been clearly demonstrated in the post TRC era, is just an entire culture shift, a, a, a norm socialization, the, an understanding uh, with wider public awareness, with more education, as Tabitha mentioned, that we have work to do and that we have uh, work to do together as government, as, as municipalities to advance these principles in practice. And it becomes um, an ethical, moral, just social imperative that we do so. And um, if I were to comment, uh, and I can speak more to this uh, at a later question, one of the biggest differences right now between the US and Canada is on that norm socialization or cultural track. Uh, we, we talk about it in Canada. Uh, it's part of municipal discussions, university discussions, provincial pro political discussions, business discussions. It's on the radar, it's on the table in ways that I haven't seen yet taken up uh, in the United States context. And there are a host of reasons for that. It's quite a multitude. It's based in different histories, different contexts, different legal frameworks. But we can talk about more about that as we get through uh, some of the other questions. So I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Excellent. If uh, Catherine, if you don't object, I, I thought I might ask a question at this point, and it it really picks up on on something that we we've seen before, um, and I know you you've all addressed in different ways expectations for this, but um, can you speak a little bit to impatience? Uh, the reason I say that is that. Um, as, as you said, Cheryl, at the outset, this has been a 30 year plus process. This, there's been a lot of, of debate. Now with legislation uh, in the Canadian parliament, are, are, what, what happens, what, what's the mood in the communities in the business community, Tabitha, or uh, from uh, the non-native community, Ken, or, or Alan, from, from your community in terms of young people, how, how patient are they willing to be and what kind of results do they need to see in order to see that this isn't just kind, nice words. You always worry about cynicism when civil rights topics come up that seem so non-negotiable, but, but where are we with that, uh, with the state of play in Canada? Is this just one, uh, one milestone on a continuing to be a long road or do we have to see some sort of concrete uh, development beyond just norm socialization in the near term to satisfy uh, the communities involved. Um, and because I was teasing Catherine about that kind of a broad question and not pointing to somebody, um, if I can, can I start with you, Alan? What's the state of expectations in your community? Um, you know, the, in our community, um, I think most indigenous communities in Canada would find the same thing. We have um, we have the individuals that have risen up to leadership. And, um, and then some of the younger, a little bit educated, have come in and, they've, and there's a disconnect between culture and uh, bringing the colonial concepts into our nation, like one person, one vote is not something our nation's traditionally did, you see, and we're struggling with the idea that, that um, you know, I, as, an, as one of the elders, I would say, my people governed themselves for thousands of years, and that, that form of government was one that um, sustained our people. And as we interject the uh, colonial uh, voting system as, um, it becomes like a popularity contest. And as a result of that, we're starting to see that disconnect from culture and, and more mainstream kind of thinking. What I hear from the younger generation though, as they become more and more educated is um, they're wanting to go back and find their roots. They're starting to go back and look to say, what is their, to recapture the, their language, to 
they're they're hungry for some of the traditional knowledge and 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 practices like living on the land, you know, uh, and uh, you know, so they they're starting to take these modern ideas like food security. You know what what we did is we used to when I was a young kid we were used to go home and and practice fishing and uh, in our traditional fishing holes and um, taught how to put the salmon up. These uh, today uh, our younger generation think of it as food security, you know, and uh, so it's not uh, it's not had some kind of modification to it. It's not using uh, vaccines and stuff. And so it's pretty um, pretty pure. And so I think, um, and I think we are starting to see a younger movement. When they, I, I forget the name of the movement it was a few years ago, but our young people are coming into the chiefs uh, forums, they offend forums in Canada and saying, it's not okay for you chiefs to get together and think you represent all people. You know, we need to have a process of selection and and have uh, the opportunity for our voices to be heard. Uh, I'm a proud, uh, proud dad. My daughter is uh, is a lawyer, and she uh, is legal counsel to the First Nation Leadership Council in British Columbia. And so I I get to watch her at work, and uh, you know they're taking the law and they understand it much better than my generation, and um, they're starting to apply it. And so I think you're seeing a more a more um, um, informed, a more knowledgeable group of young people taking their role as leaders. Excellent. Thank, thank you very much for that. Tabitha, in, in the business community, um, the Aboriginal business community, what, what are the tangible expectations people have and, and are they patient to see this process develop or do they need something more than, than just this legislation, maybe some further action? How would you characterize the the sense of your members? I think um, I think there's lots of questions about UNDRIP about what it will mean. I think definitely, um, as Alan and Cheryl both said, the um, from a corporate Canada, the non-Indigenous business community who are also our members, um, you know, if they are our members, then then they are have already demonstrated that they want to understand how better to work with indigenous business and communities so are starting to build those relationships but definitely we're seeing a lot of panels like this where where there's a question about what does what does under it mean and i think the majority feel that it will bring more certainty also um uh for you know those those bad actors that that they might be in competition with. Uh, if we can bring everyone along, I think it puts uh, more certainty in the industry sector. I think from a patient's perspective, um, you know, we've been living with the Indian Act in Canada for close to 150 years, and we've been talking about dismantling it and going back to self-government for uh, almost all of those. So um, I think uh, we're a, a patient people. And um, we're not going anywhere. So we're also a resilient people. So we'll continue to work towards moving back to self-government and relearning all of those traditions and uh, culture that we weren't allowed to practice. I think, you know, as a um, not a younger generation, but, uh, you know, I have younger kids. They're 12 and 15. And um, my dad grew up in a community um, but a community in which they, they were very Christian. So, um, didn't really have powwows or celebrate and, and, it, you know, definitely in Ontario, we, we've been without our culture and without practicing our culture longer than on the West coast. So we're really trying to rebuild that and relearn that. And, um, I definitely see that in my generation, uh, and, and in my children as well, like, you know, to have that pride again and, and to be proud to, to speak out and, and proud to say that you're, you're a first nation, um, whether you live in your community or don't. Um, so I think as, as Alan said, as we all begin and our, our younger generation begins to relearn that as well, um, we're strengthened by that, but also I think just the youngest, younger generation, as Cheryl said, this cultural shift. Um, the youth of today, the people that are in, you know, secondary schools, uh, 
even elementary schools um, have a, a greater respect for the Indigenous people in this country. And we see those people as they graduate looking to work for organizations that demonstrate that same respect. Um, so I think that too will help to move forward. Uh, but I think there is still also uncertainty as to, so once the bill is, is enacted, then there's, you know, the implementation plans that need to be drafted. So when will this, will this take action? And I know we're going to talk a little bit about what needs to happen first or, or where we need to go first, but um, it, it, it's, it's going to be a journey. And I think most people are prepared for that. Thank you very much. Um, Ken, uh, uh, speak, looking at this um, outside the Indigenous community, it's easy to see this as, as, a, as a gesture, you know, to acknowledge the, the rights of Indigenous peoples, but it's more than that. It has to be more than that. What's your sense of, of where the rubber meets the road? Issues like funding properly to really fulfill commitments uh, here. How how patient um, can we be with the Trudeau government or with future governments? Uh, or is this going to be something that, that really comes in as a gesture and then there's an election and we move, move on? Well, I'm actually very nervous that this will become more symbolic and more of a gesture than anything particularly pragmatic. I mean, the Bill C-15 C has sort of no real oper operational elements. It doesn't have a budget. It doesn't have clear commitments. It really is sort of an aspirational document, which is how people used to describe UNRIP itself. Um, and and I'll, I'll tell you, my one great concern is that Indigenous people have lived with broken promises from non-Indigenous governments um, from the very beginning of time, since the first Europeans arrived. And so that, that's a frustration. Um, the other side of it, though, is that there actually is a far, far deeper people, you know, Cheryl and Tabitha and Alan have talked about it. There's a far deeper sort of understanding that things absolutely have to change. So where does the driving force come from? I think the driving force is coming as much from business as anywhere else. People are looking for it in the wrong places. Like Cheryl, I work in a university. We spend an awful lot of time talking about this. We make some very important gestures that have done some very important and valuable things. Um, has the basic fundamental of a university changed? Not really. You know, we're, we're, we're trying and our Indigenous colleagues have done an amazing job of bringing new perspectives to bear on all of our topics and whatever, but that's really slow. What's really interesting is in the business community, things appear to have changed much faster. Um, and a long time ago, everybody's concern about UNRIP was, was they only focused on one thing, which is free prior to informed consent. And they only focused on that as it related to resource development. If you ask the majority of Canadians, what do they think about UNDRIP? Most of them will say, I don't like that free prior and informed consent piece. That's way too strong. That's way too much of a commitment, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's nonsense. Uh, free prior and informed consent works fine. Um, indigenous governments have actually been working with the resource sector in many, many ways. We have, what's the number out of 400 um, agreements between mining companies and indigenous communities alone. Allen's community, the Chaltan, uh, one of the best in the world at finding mutually acceptable and profitable arrangements for their community uh, through, through, you know, through the business connections. They don't need UNDRIP to tell them what to do. They just need to listen to the local population. So I think we're seeing a, a, a sort of a, a ground shift. Um, the other part that Tabitha talks about is there is a, a sense of accomplishment in indigenous business community that Canadians don't really appreciate. Uh, we sometimes get excited and Tabitha puts out her reports and talks about how many people are, how many companies have been formed and where, where they're actually doing really well. Um, but there's actually something qualitatively different about a lot of Indigenous business. It isn't just about making money in a commercial way. A lot of Indigenous businesses are community owned. They're, they're economic development corporations. They have hundreds of millions, now billions of dollars of assets. So I look forward to a day not so long from now where you have five or six Indigenous owned companies in the top 100 companies in Canada. We're not there very far off that, right? Five of them will probably be leading three or four of them simultaneously. So, so we're, we're doing better in some respects. What I worry about from the government side is we're good at virtue signaling. And this is not a comment on the liberals or conservatives or the NDP in British Columbia. We, we have trouble getting past that point. Alan mentioned this about the bureaucracy. So what does this actually mean in practice? It means changing everything, changing the way you think, changing the way you act, changing the way you allocate funding and sharing a sense of urgency with the indigenous population. That is where the country is not quite at. We are not sharing that sense of urgency. 
Um, so Tabitha mentioned the fact that indigenous folks are incredibly patient. I wish I could bottle that and sell it. I'd be a billionaire. I have no explanation for why the indigenous people are so patient after so many years. I'm really glad they are. I think young people are determined to see a different world. Um, and I actually think we've got enough non-Indigenous allies now that we can actually have hope, hope for that. And we are seeing some substantial change, but, but it's going to take longer than people think. Excellent. Well, this, at least from my point of view, that means more panels, uh, which is uh, good. We have to keep this conversation going. Um, Cheryl, I, I just want to bring you in on, on this. My last question, I'm giving it back to Catherine in a minute. I'm just a terrible panel hog, but uh, I, I wonder if you could draw out a little bit the Canada-US difference here. I certainly think in terms of impatience, uh, in terms of expectations, you don't see the same level uh, of engagement on UNDRIP here in the United States, certainly not in the public domain. Um, what can we learn from what's happening in Canada? What can we try to do better? Or are there some areas where we're already doing something right in the United States? How would you characterize the sort of cross-border distinctions and, and how we're doing? Yeah, I, I appreciate that question. And I just want to, uh, from my own standpoint, affirm a, a few of the points that I've just heard from my, my fellow panelists. I think there is a generational shift absolutely in Canada. Um, and certainly, uh, and Ken will agree with me on this, working in universities, we see a lot of young people and there's a, a different sensibility. There is a different sense of uh, what's right and what's wrong and what's tolerable. And uh, again, it's palpable. We, we can see this, this and it's happened, I would say, in the last um, eight to 10 years in particular, I've, I've noticed a, a sea change among the young people. So I think change is coming. How patient are people? Well, oh, um, I think that varies tremendously. Uh, I, there is tremendous patience and pragmatism among many Indigenous peoples. I think it would, uh, it, it's good role modeling for most of society uh, on, on patience and, and and good politics. However, I also know there's a significant trust deficit in many indigenous circles. And uh, there are plenty of people in this country that uh, do not trust the liberal government, think this is a bait and switch strategy of some kind, and uh, are expressing some serious concerns about this legislation. And perhaps it's the virtual sig signaling uh, aspect of it that worries them. Uh, they think it's uh, they think it's some sort of a Trojan horse uh, for something else. And, and that's a very uh, it's a minority of folks, but it's, it's they are expressing sent sentiments that are quite widely spread, like they're not sure that they're getting a fair deal and there must be something else behind the deal. And that is a, a pattern of history that goes way, way, way back to early treaties and, and the unfair dealings of the past. So it's not so easy to shake that off. Um, but if we look at uh, both countries in North America, and I, I've gestured to this earlier, uh, there are very different, even though similar histories, there are some important differences in, in legal frameworks and where we began these journeys. And I think that plays out in multiple ways and is impacting uh, the differences we're seeing in the two countries in terms of how UNDRIP is being taken up um, and, and actually pushed on the agenda or not. Um, and I think while we can recognize Canada has uh, the very important section 35 in our constitution, which is significantly stronger than the three small references to tribal nations that, is, that are in the US constitution. Um, and that uh, looks like it's starting from uh, a very progressive and forward place. I think it's important to um, take a look at the US model and realize how important the concept of tribal sovereignty is uh, in the US and how fundamental that is currently to the relationships between tribal nations there and federal government. Um, and not only that, but the federal government has had, um, while it waffles a bit here and there, by and large, a strong self-determination policy since the 1970s, which, you know, I hate to say this, is getting upwards of 50 years. Uh, that's, uh, you know, friends don't tell friends that the 70s was 50 years ago, but here we are. Uh, and uh, in, in 50 years, there's been uh, 
a fairly uniform recognition by the federal government that tribes, where possible, should be self-determining. And that is a concept that's been very slow to take up in, in the Canadian federal uh, understanding. And the U.S. Supreme Court has made many rulings uh, over the last couple of centuries that uh, have maintained, uh, and it doesn't do this consistently, there's always an ebb and flow and a back and forth on, on Supreme Court rulings on federal Indian cases, but it has founded itself and grounded itself in the Marshall decisions of the 1830s, which recognize, um, even though problematic, and I can certainly argue with them, uh, some amount of inherent sovereignty of tribal nations. Uh, they've called them, and this has been the formation of policy, domestic dependent nations. But that starts from a very different frame than the Indian Act in Canada, which has uh, uh, it, it's a piece of legislation from the late 19th century that does not talk about the inherent self-determination or sovereignty of Indigenous peoples. It colonizes them completely. It put them under complete control of the federal uh, Indian agencies and agents. Uh, every bit of movements, education, uh, marriage, everything was controlled uh, by the Indian agent and by the Indian Act. So both countries are just starting from very different places. And as we move forward, then we see that played out in very different ways. And so, uh, for example, two major advancements in, in legislation here in Canada in recent years, uh, 2019 was a, a quite big year. Uh, one of those was the Child Welfare Act, uh, which turned over more jurisdiction and more control to Indigenous peoples in Canada. Uh, well, in the US, the idea that a, a tribe has jurisdiction over its own family law, child welfare is already 50 years old, uh, just about. Tribal courts are well established. Some tribes exercise complete jurisdiction over family matters, uh, marriages, divorces, child welfare, uh, and so on, uh, child apprehension. There's been strong legislation in place that recognizes that inherent sovereignty of tribal nations that has just uh, began the last generation on a different foothold and a different conversation. Now, that's not to say that the situation in the US is uh, exactly in alignment with UNDRIP. It is most certainly not. Uh, but the trajectory and the journey and the conversations are entirely different uh, because different courts, different understandings, different histories, different fundamentals. So it's important to understand that. And um, I know that out of the University of Colorado Boulder now is a, a project to begin to advance the declaration in the United States. So I think they're on the, the early side of that uh, norm socialization phase and beginning the discussion absent a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, I would say they have uh, uh, some, ser some serious work to uh, do to make up uh, some of those deficits. But they have to situate that very differently uh, from the conversation in Canada. It it's just a different journey. Excellent. Thank you very much. And, and let me turn it to Catherine. We have some questions from the audience and I'll let her uh, see what she wants to do with those. Well, thanks. Uh, a lot of really good questions coming in and, and certainly the discussion so far has really started to get the, the wheels moving in different people's minds. So I appreciate your comments so far. Um, one that I think is interesting that's come in around how, um, you know, the industry right now, and I would say particularly in the extractive industry, but not limited by any means, um, the discussion um, is really focused on ESG, so environmental social governance uh, factors. And that's becoming, um, it's getting a lot more attention um, in the business community, but I would say also when you look at uh, some of the movements from the regulatory side of things. Uh, so I'd be curious to hear, and obviously one of our members is, is curious to hear how you see um, UNDRIP and the, the work in reconciliation um, factoring into a company's ESG performance um, and what kind of incremental uh, social change we can see um, through business as a result of this and, and maybe just expand upon the role of business to, to, be, to go beyond the sort of normal um, financial factors and, and look at some of the broader um, ESG performance. Maybe Tabitha, I'll start with you on that concept. Sure, thanks. Uh, so I think 
I would like to think that corporate Canada doesn't need UNDRIP in order to be good partners and in order to move forward on understanding what they can do to uh, look across their organization at how they're working with Indigenous people and Indigenous communities and businesses and, and how they are truly moving on reconciliation. I don't think we need UNDRIP to be implemented for any corporation to take that. And um, I would hope that those businesses who move forward, and we've seen this, those businesses who, who move forward irrespective of UNDRIP um, is where there is opportunity to build bridges and to work with Indigenous people. If we look at Indigenous youth as the fastest growing population in Canada, um, the opportunity for skills and employment um, with respect to Indigenous people is, is an opportunity itself. With 60,000 Indigenous businesses in Canada, the opportunity to be able to work with those businesses and, and see them as innovators is a huge opportunity for corporate Canada as well. You know, there's this real conversation about ESG and is there what's the business case for ESG and is it a business case that people need to see a profitable business case or or is it really that an organization sees the social implications as a responsibility. Um, so we have a program at CCAB called Progressive Aboriginal Relations, and it's a program in which a corporation looks across their organization um, from employment, business development, leadership actions, and community relations, and they set intentions in all of those pillars um, to understand how they can do better. So they will set targets of procuring from Indigenous business or um, uh, business equity partnerships, or they will set targets around community relations. So, and we really did see this more in the extractive industries first, but now we're seeing corporations um, in tech sectors like um, Shopify, as an example, who are trying to understand how they can do better uh, with Indigenous communities through community relations. How can they support Indigenous entrepreneurs? Uh, so as we move forward to that, um, organizations that I don't, they don't have to uh, work with communities. So they're not just concerned about, about FPIC. They're, they're really wanting to understand how they can be better corporate citizens. And I think that is where ESG plays a role. And I, I would really love to see, and there's been lots of discussion about this, um, how do we include within an ESG goal uh, or ESG criteria, specifically an organization's work with indigenous communities and indigenous people. Um, so, the, so our certification, the PAR certification does do that. Um, there is independent verifiers that go into your organization and understand what you're doing, speak to your communities that you're working with, speak to your employees. And then we have an independent jury that will certify an organization. There's about 150 corporations in Canada going through our certification right now. So that is very optimistic and, and we're seeing more and more corporations want to join and, and want to take on that program, uh, which I think also is is optimistic. And, and I do think that ESG conversation has definitely moved that forward as well. And and also investors. So um, as people, and, and this speaks to the young people as well, but young people not only want to make sure they're investing in, in companies that respect sustainable and an environmental guidelines, but we do have uh, investors specifically asking, how do I know if I'm investing in an organization that uh, is doing good work with Indigenous people and Indigenous communities? Um, so I think there is a definite uh, opportunity there for organizations to ensure that they are doing good work, that they're being respectful, that they're finding opportunities to support communities and businesses, and the investment community is looking at that. Uh, and I think corporations need to be, be really um, understanding that 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 is happening in the investment community as well. Absolutely, um, absolutely, such an interesting um, drift of of how companies are starting to spend a lot more time um, digging into the 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 actual performance on this issue. Alan, perhaps I can ask you to also comment on this, and I think it's interesting to get your views um, both from uh, what you're seeing with the BC Mining and Energy um, Council and, and how um, the performance of companies on a broader range of topics is factoring into the type of acceptance it might get in the local communities. 
Um, thank you. Um, you know, the ESG is the new word in my, in my world. But uh, again, it's, it's one of those situations where somebody has gone off in their corners into their corporate offices and they've developed a policy around ESG and then, and then you try to bring it in and apply it in our communities. It doesn't work very well. You know, I think that this is a real clear example of, um, of a need for industry to um, bring us into the house to be a part of developing these kinds of policies. Uh, clearly, it did not take our interest into account as they started to craft those, those DSG policies for the big financial institutions. Um, I want to look at it this way. You know, Mother Earth's in trouble. We have climate change and uh, upon us in such a significant way that it's threatening humankind and all living species on this earth. And that when I look at ESG, I look at the indigenous people are the ones that have to bring that message forward. It's gotta be an important component of development as we move forward. How do you reduce your carbon footprint? I look at things like standards. You know, um, we're, we're starting to see the big corporations like BMW, Apple, uh, Microsoft, um, starting to uh, look to develop standards that, that uh, they want to source responsible metals. And I think that is really important. And um, as I look at, at um, you know, my, I remember when I was working in the Yukon, as they settled their land claim self-government agreement, the, the question was asked, is the basket of uh, rights full? And what, what, they, what the, the takeaway was, it's not full, because we need to talk about things like intellectual property. Um, and, you know, because, for example, I, I understand that there was a research projects going on in our, one of the northern communities about because so many of them had TB, the question was why? And when you start to think about that kind of a, a research project, you realize that there's a huge economic component to that. If you can find, uh, you know, the pharmaceuticals can actually benefit hugely from that kind of information. And First Nations are not part of the economic side of the equation of that. You know, I wanted to, uh, if you don't mind, I would like to speak about um, the US uh, businesses and uh, First Nation governance. You know, many years ago, I, I went up to Alaska. It was, it was like, we wanted to, I wanted to take a look at it as a, it's like looking into the future because in Alaska, they had the Settlement Act. And as a result of that, there were, I think, um, 12 or 13 corporations that were created. Today, there's three or four of them that would rank in the top 50 in US. And um, I, I note that the Southern Ute, you know, the last time I talked to them had something like 12 or $15 billion in trust, major economic players. And I point out to the group that indigenous peoples are the, in Canada for sure, maybe in the US as well, are the largest private landholders in the country. You know, and, and when we see policies crafted between government like the um, recent protocol on, on critical metals. Where's our indigenous voice in these things? You know, when you create the North American energy strategy, where is the indigenous voice? We need the first peoples of, these, of this continent to be involved in those discussions. 
we have some we have access to some of the largest natural gas reserves in North America. We, you know, if we stay dependent on fossil fuels, some of the largest oil deposits in in North America. And um, and you know, in some respects, the Jay Treaty still applies, at least for Canadians going south. You know, there needs to be a talk about those borders, those artificial borders. And we need to be talking about how do you, how do you eliminate those, especially in a business context? Thank you. Thanks, Alan. That's really uh, good food for thought in terms of thinking about how um, Indigenous peoples are viewing the, the topics and, and what might be drafted in a boardroom, how does that play out on the ground? I think it's good for us to really think this through. Um, Ken, maybe I'll toss this question over to you. I'm sure you've got a few thoughts on it um, to, to um, give us your, your view on how ESG is sort of playing into the business role and how, um, how reconciliation and how UNDRIP can play into that concept. I think we've had some really good observations already. Uh, essentially, those companies that really need First Nations and Inuit and Métis participation are already there. Um, the mining sector, the forestry sector, pipelines, things of that sort, are, are made some pretty significant moves and did so before ESG became sort of a, the acronym of the month. Um, they were already sort of sort of there. Uh, Canadian corporations that don't have that same imperative are, are not doing all that much. So the ones that are urban-based, yes, we can talk about Shopify, and it's actually making some really serious and, and determined efforts to, to learn and to see where they can participate. But, you know, almost every every couple of months, you'll hear a story of an Indigenous person going into a retail store, being profiled by, by staff and being sort of, you know, pushed outside because they thought they were stealing or something ridiculous like that. You know, so, so we're a long way away uh, from actually sort of picking these things up as a sort of a central point. But, but I guess I, I, I turned it a different way around. When companies follow ESG principles or whatever they call them, under principles, or simply engage in full partnership and full collaboration, the companies actually end up doing better. Um, we've got a lot of companies that do really well because they have good partnerships. Um, we can look at Boise Bay, we can look at Cameco in Northern Alberta, we can look at Suncor or Cameco in Northern Saskatchewan, Cameco in Northern Alberta. These are big extractive companies that have figured out that partnership actually is good business. And as a good solid foundation, they get, they get better approvals, they, get, they go through regulatory processes more quickly, they do it collaboratively. We're, we're getting pretty close on certain elements. Number one is real partnerships. Number two is a shift toward equity investment. So indigenous people now start to own part of the means of production. Uh, they're actually involved in that way. They get a lot much larger return. We're seeing governments that are accepting the concept of co-production. I, I think Cheryl was the one that mentioned this in terms of British Columbia, where, where the British Columbia government is actually co-producing its under response with First Nations people. The government of Canada has been doing that very quietly. Uh, they're not drawn attention to it. They've been doing this on a whole bunch of different files. Um, and I think it's, it's quite important. Not clear they've actually done it on UNDRIP, on Bill C-15, though, which is kind of odd. You know, they've negotiated with the national organizations, but there's a fair number of rights-holding First Nations um, in the Inuit and Métis communities who say, you didn't even talk to us. You're bringing this forward and it didn't. It doesn't really relate to our, our circumstances or telling us what's going to happen here. So we have to be really careful here. So let's just not do these things for symbolic purposes. Let's look back at the fundamental partnerships. Indigenous folks deserve full partnership and confederation. They deserve full engagement in, their, in, the, in the economy, not just the resource economy, but the economy as a whole. They deserve to share in prosperity, however they define that, not by objective urban white standards, but by Indigenous standards. They deserve that opportunity for uh, for full partnership. Um, and how are we doing in that regard? Not not so well, not so well. And as soon as it starts to cost something, as soon as you start adding it up. So my concern about UNDRIP is if you actually put cost to UNDRIP, the, the, all the different 49 sections or however many sections there are, and say, what would it actually cost to do this? The number is staggering. Now, what is the cost of not doing it? It's staggering times five, right? But the, but the, the short-term cost is really, really high. And, and that's where the Canadian resolve disappears. Um, and so I think, you know, we're, we should take the lead from the business communities 
that have figured this out, the corporations, the indigenous communities like Allen's group in the Taltan, who are doing really well, some of the urban Aboriginal folks in Calgary and Vancouver, who've done extremely well in finding new opportunities for partnership. And you know what? The, the world didn't end. You know, empowering Indigenous people did not bring some dark veil over the country that created all sorts of dislocations and whatever. That's the scare factor we've lived with for, for a number of years. When the Nishka Treaty was signed, which was not all that long ago, I mean, back in the 1990s, people were saying, oh, we're going to see my tiny little principalities grow up all over the place, the fragmentation of Canada. Well, that's nonsense. That's not what happened. The Nishka have collaborated very, very well with non-Aboriginal people, with companies, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, so this sort of chicken little, the sky is falling stuff doesn't work. The other side of it, self-empowered, self-governing Indigenous people in control of child welfare, in control of their own governance and education and health systems are, are, are a benefit to everybody. The country's stronger as a result. And why will you resist this so strongly is a matter of enormous concern for me. Well, I, I, I know, Catherine, we are uh, coming close to our time. I have about five minutes left. And so if you don't mind, I wanted to ask one question that picks up on what Ken was talking about, but I think has been a theme here. Uh, maybe it's a, a, a Washington, D.C. cultural thing, but I, I always focus on acronyms. Love acronyms. UNDRIP is one. But, but another one which, uh, which has started to enter my vernacular is FPIC, uh, Free Prior and Informed Consent. And there has been a real, a really interesting discussion among legal scholars, among academics, about the relationship and the operationalization of free prior and informed consent versus how it's often labeled in the Canadian media a veto. Uh, indigenous veto on projects, etc. So I know that's a that's a that's a tricky issue. But if I could ask everyone um, uh, on the panel to, to sort of draw the distinctions between FPIC and a veto, and whether that is one of the the importance of that issue for our understanding of how UNDRIP will actually operate uh, here, um, and I'll start maybe ask ask Cheryl, uh, then Tabitha, then Alan, and and then Ken. Over to you, Cheryl. Uh, thanks for that. And I think it's a very important question because that if you open up a Canadian newspaper and you uh, start to see a conversation about FPIC, you'll see the word veto. And there's a lot of fear about it. And uh, I think a, a lot of misdirected fear to my mind uh, because the situation that we have had is that the party with the veto is the government. So um, if uh, an indigenous people object to a project, they can be overruled by the government who says, no, this is in the public interest and we don't care whether you oppose it or not. We have decided we're going through with it. Um, FPIC is a corrective to that and says, no, indigenous peoples do have the right actually to say yes to a project, to say no to a project, or to say yes with conditions to a project. Um, there is nothing earth shattering about that. That is very ordinary in a democratic society. It indicates that no one has absolute power over anyone else. So to my mind, the question of where the veto is right now is misplaced. Um, it's actually the question of why should a government, a democratic, liberal government grounded in the, the common law um, have an absolute power over some peoples and not others. And so FPIC is a corrective to that. FPIC says, no, Indigenous peoples do have the equal right to self-determination as everyone else in the society, and they do have the right to give their views. And if, if a project is going to impact them, it's absolutely essential that they give consent or they set the conditions for that. It's really um, a, quite a logical fallacy to look at it in any other way. Hey, thanks for that, Tabitha. What What do you think? Oh, thank you. Uh, I, I'll I'll be very quick because I think Cheryl really covered it. I I think the word veto does create uh, fear um, as in UNDRIP, but there's so many other parts of UNDRIP that are not that are not with respect to the free prior and informed consent. And you know, I heard Murray Sinclair speak about on a panel about this and. Um, he said that uh, FPIC is not a veto, it's an obligation on behalf of resource companies to ensure that they get consent. So uh, I think we need to look at it from uh, 
it's an obligation to ensure that your partnership is strong, to ensure that you've worked with the communities that you are going to be impacting and that you put in place what is required for them to provide consent. Uh, and if we look at it from that perspective of, of in, informing the people that you're trying to be partners with um, and ensuring that they have consent, that they've given you consent, um, it's really more of an obligation than uh, if we look at it from that way than the side of the veto. Excellent. Um, Alan and Zerza, do you have a comment on, on FBIC? Um, yes. Um, you know, I, when I hear the, the, um, the question of veto uh, versus consent, what it tells me is that there's still a lot of mistrust. And it's, it's, um, it's all about divide and conquer kind of stuff. You know, consent is about a, it's a process. It's a process about how do you how do you get to build the support or how do you do an informed no to, to a project that typically is going to seriously impact our lands or our people. And in my view, uh, consent is about building a positive relationship. Excellent. Thank you for that. And and Ken, I'm going to give you the, the last word on this, um, but it does seem to build on what you were saying earlier about trust and also about some of the fears about going forward outside the Indigenous community. It actually reveals the fact that far too many non-Indigenous people have actually no little or no contact with Indigenous folks. If you actually spend time with Indigenous folks, consent's not an insurmountable area, it's a logical one. Um, and in fact, if you look at the exercise of, of veto on development projects, there's actually more examples of non-Indigenous people vetoing projects than Indigenous people vetoing projects. You know, we don't talk about it that way. We have lots of examples where municipalities get in the way or, or, or pressure groups get in the way, right? So consent is first, not, first off, it's not, a, it's not an insurmountable barrier. And in fact, if Indigenous people don't want a project, either you modify it, fix it, change it, or drop it. Because it's if, if a community is not going to support it, you're just not going to get it there. And, and probably shouldn't get there. The First Nations are not, and Métis and Indian you know, people are not unreasonable. Uh, they want economic development. They want prosperity. They, that's, that's not a problem. Second point, why do we always talk about EPIC only in the context of natural resource development? It actually appears multiple times in UNDRIP. It refers to government policy. And actually specifically says you cannot have any government policy that affects Aboriginal people passed without free prior and informed consent. Well, that's a much larger barrier, quite frankly, than the one about economic development. We figured out the economic development one. Good corporations with good intent, with good projects, with a good attitude toward environmental sustainability and, and, and mitigation can get their projects through by being honest and upfront and collaborative and taking the time to do it properly. When is government going to apply its, that a standard to itself? Um, I don't mean federal government or whatever else. We, we're not even close to that on that particular one, and we need to be be much clearer. So, uh, the short, at the end of the day, the answer is, to my mind, Indigenous people are our neighbors. They're our friends. They're our collaborators. They're our partners. Um, they, they belong. They, they deserve all the opportunities that are provided in UNDRIP and well beyond that. Um, our Canadian state owns way, owes way more to Indigenous people even the one under it sort of clarifies. We've got huge histories to overcome. And, and so I think, you know, we get caught up in acronyms and details and worry about the small stuff. Meanwhile, you know, I, I just finished driving around Yukon and going into these incredible indigenous communities that are suffering with like 80% unemployment, serious social challenges. And then people get together in Ottawa and talk about acronyms. You know, come on folks, we can do a lot better than this in this country. Um, and we've got lots of models to draw on. Well, that uh, that's a affectation or a problem that we have in Washington as well as as I revealed acronyms are uh, well they're they're the way we live so uh, so we do need to get beyond acronyms we do need to understand these concepts and I think for for me this has been a tremendous tremendous discussion and if I could take one thing away from it uh, for me it was the optimism the sense that things are on a track and that even as justifiable as impatience or frustration might be for Canada's First Nations, there's a commitment to just keep 
uh, to use another bad analogy, beavering away and uh, making the progress as best uh, as best we can. So this is something I hope most uh, hope that here in the United States we can take equally seriously. I also hope that this is not the last time we have this conversation. We need to build on this and uh, and learn from one another. Uh, it, tremendous panel. Um, let me thank uh, Catherine. Uh, Tegelberg for partnering with us. I'm so pleased to see Newmont's uh, Center uh, for Global Indigenous uh, Community Relations uh, starting to, to take shape. Uh, and it's been wonderful to work with you and, and to connect with the community. And I wanna thank our, our speakers, um, Cheryl Lightfoot, Tabitha Bull, uh, Alan Azurza and Ken Coates. Uh, each of you brought so much to this discussion. I'm really, really grateful. And uh, in particular, I'm grateful that you were the, for the four of you who are in um, Pacific time, that uh, that you got up very early to educate us here on the East Coast, uh, uh, I, I, I owe you all a beer or two. Uh, so <laughs> apologies for, for the early start. Thank you all for participation. And we look forward to picking up this discussion again, hopefully soon. Thanks, everybody.